After my last adventure in a frozen planet, it was time to try the opposite, a super hot volcanic planet. I started by creating an unlimited custom star system with just one rocky planet as close to the sun as possible. It started out with an average of 57 degrees temperature which, yes, that is very hot. Regardless that I said I want volcanic activity, I did start with a very low core heat because we will experiment with volcanoes after I stabilize the planet. I started to use the raised water tool to create some soil moisture. This is actually something I learned after putting the soil moisture video, but I don't even need to use comets. That said, you can immediately see all that water drying up and I put up the chart of the moisture water proportion and you can see that will have a very high ratio because all the water is now in the atmosphere as clouds. And that is something you are going to expect in a hot planet, a lot of humidity against the water. Before really continuing further, I did want to smoothen the terrain. I achieved a very good result, there was still like a bit of difference in some, but that difference was quite negligible. So once I've done that, I continued to raise water and that should have dispersed basically the humidity, the clouds and I tweaked the rainfall rate to make it very high because I did want all that cloud to become rain right away and I continued adding water until there was a puddle. For that I did dig out a kind of a lake or something very very deep so that when I place water that stays there and that will be our main source of life for this planet. And if we look at the humidity the full planet is humid, the full planet is moist, so no comets are needed. We just raised water and this planet is pretty much okay to go. I continued tweaking the raised water until I was satisfied with the levels of moisture, but this planet is quite sad. As soon as I started to place some creatures and plants, I put the mutation rates up to 20% because we probably need a good level of mutation for life to make it out. And of course, we did have to play the cell stage to create our first fungi. When looking at the animals and plants, they resisted around 120-130 degrees Celsius and yeah, that was a very warm lake. However, fast forward to year 18,000 and that lake has pretty much almost dried up. Maybe it's just not enough water in the planet, which could be true, so I raised some water again both in the lake and in some other small sections. When I returned less than 10,000 years later, somehow the population really made it successfully out to, into the land, which I was not expecting so quickly. We had vegetation, which was all over the world. So many animals, both in the lake and outside. And I'm like, perfect, the planet is stable. Let's now reduce the water so we can flatten it out continue with a pure spherical planet and don't have any input of that lake or whatsoever. Shortly after flattening the planet, I started to see that the vegetation was decreasing and when I looked at the logs it said not enough nitrogen or carbon dioxide. And I had a look at the creatures map and they were struggling to eat. And yeah, we experienced our first proper mass extinction. So I started over by creating that crater again and filling it up with water. Again, we want our lake of life. And I'm not really sure where nitrogen comes from, but it is clear that this water was essential. After creating again some basic life forms, immediately the fungi population started populating and even diverging into a new species. The plants as well, creatures were populating, so the pond was happy. Jump to around 20,000 years later and these animals have not made it out of this water. One thing I noticed is that there is literally no life outside of this crater and that is because it is so deep that there is a huge temperature difference. Because the closer to earth, the warmer that section is. So I had to try and increase the land to flatten it out a bit. And as soon as I did that, you can see almost all animals had died. There was still some life, but I did have to start over for the most part. 
not wanting to start over for another time, I decided to go into the encyclopedia and explore the fungi, so I don't have to play the cell stage again. And yes, fungi and plants are now exportable since the latest update. In less than 10,000 years, the plants started to spread outside of the water. So clearly, this change in altitude made the plants in a temperature good enough that they can spread. Now, where I was noticing some dry soil, I decided to use the raised moisture so that the plants could spread out. And for the next couple of minutes, I was just looking at the pretty grass converging like those colors. And I even had to zoom in to see how, how it looks like when it's spreading out in the real world. Around 4,000 years later, I also noticed that the fungi population has grown into a thousand. And that is because the fungi has made it onto land as well, and it was spreading really fascinating when you look at the map. At one point, a meteor landed on the lake, pretty much. And this is a perfect example why I need meteor shields, because if I did not have that in place, that would have wiped out all the creatures that I've worked for, and we gotta avoid those mass extinctions at this stage. At the year 89,000, I noticed that the animals are still within the lake, but the plants have evolved to become trees. So I had a look around the world and I could see the trees growing and sprouting everywhere. I mean, look at them. They have like long, thin stems. They have fruits. So once our animals go onto land, they have plenty of food to eat. Knowing that I will probably do something dumb in the future, I did decide to evolve a couple of things, including this quickly warm tree, because it had a very good range of temperature and it looked pretty. It took almost another 20,000 years before I saw the first creature crawl on land. Now, I was very happy about this because we've waited a very long time since the first mass extinction. But finally, it has happened. And within 5,000 years, there was so much activity with omnivores attacking each other, eating the plants, and there was a relatively good balance of activity as the creature population count continued to grow up to 1,000. As the population was thriving, the planet was very stable, I decided I needed to tweak some things a little. I tested out a bit of a smaller rainfall and I also reduce the mutation rate to 6% to stabilize the planet since I didn't need that 20% anymore. At this rate we already had these humongous creatures which were really cool, there were so much variety and I mean I love looking at them and obviously turtle shells will always have a great place in my heart. We have the, the mushrooms. The variety on this planet was insane. There were creatures with beaks, creatures with antlers, there's like everything. With that in mind, this is not a success story yet, because we want to test out the core heat. I started from 0 to 7. Right away, there were volcanoes all around the planet. Obviously, the lava killed anything around it right away. There were so many earthquakes, the land started changing, and yeah, it just lava everywhere. And it was still stable enough, so I went, yeah, let's go all the way, maximum core heat. This is the planet to do it. On the observer mode, the camera goes crazy. It's like earthquake, volcano, earthquake, earthquake, volcano, volcano, earthquake. The map is like flashing half red. The population count half to 500. There was so much dust in the air, but we still had life. The temperature was like 110 degrees average. It was honestly crazy. And I had a look at the altitude map and you can see some very weird ridges and mountains. And when I look at the tectonic plates, there's like four pulling from one single spot. And I'm like, yeah, it makes sense why there's so much volcanoes. Unfortunately, around 10,000 years later, I started noticing a lot of dry patches. Well, they were moist, but they did not have trees. And that's partly because the dust cooled down the planet. The dust is protecting us from the sun, and the plants cannot survive in that temperature below 110. Because of that, for the first time in this game, I evolved manually a plant 
that was able to survive those temperatures because now the water has also cooled. So the starting temperature of the plant is cooler than my initial experiment. To be fair, with high volcanic activity, this temperature would have been the start base. That plant starting to spread really easily onto the land, and obviously because it's pink, I love seeing that. There were still some of the old trees within the center, kind of within the equator, where it was warmer. However, both plants were at big risk because I noticed all that pink fade away, and as soon as I clicked to tag the logs, we had, once again, not enough carbon dioxide or nitrogen. And here, I'm a little confused because I do have water, so where is that nitrogen coming from? I still am not 100% sure, so I tried to remove the dust, is it the dust? And by removing the dust, it warmed up that section and water evaporated and it did not solve the problem and instead, <laughs> that increase in temperature killed everything instantly. So we have our second mass extinction. Returning the mutation rate to 15%, I decided obviously to start over with again new life forms, but I did want to import some stuff from the previous years, including the tree that I had exported because it can survive and it will fast track the experiment because if it can survive, we can get there. It's just saving us some time from doing it all over. I also imported two of the creatures hot fruit and coal for Santa, because again, I don't want to wait another like 50,000 years just to see creatures go on land. The trees were really thriving, so where the creatures, to be honest, they started spreading. I also imported another omnivore that I had exported from earlier, and we had a decent variety already starting to thrive. At some point, I also noticed that one of them did mutate into a carnivore, so I always like seeing predators being evolved naturally and obviously I did have to take a look up close because a pink predator love but also even the herbivores they were big head, big neck, big beak it was like amazing I love this tropical volcanic planet once again I did now lower back to 7.5% mutation rate because it was mostly herbivores, 66%, and then like 26% omnivores, it was time to try an experiment with a photosynthetic animal. Because we've seen last time they kind of took over, but I do think in this planet they will not dominate. It's like we have enough vegetation for the herbivores. I let my simulation run over the lake and it's really beautiful to see so many thousands of years passed by so quickly but unfortunately flashbang and like whoa the water is drying up and i had a look at the atmosphere percentages and the nitrogen was slowly plummeting so yes there is a correlation between the water activity and nitrogen the water pretty much fully dried up and i'm like is this our third mass extinction Luckily, I noticed there were other puddles of waters within the map, and what's happening is because the volcanic activity and earthquakes created valleys, whenever it's raining, these sections are having the water stored there. Now, sometimes there are calm volcanoes and lava that help evaporate it, but then the rain settles elsewhere. So there is always some level of water activity, and there's always some level of nitrogen keeping the planet alive. Every time the planet is stable, of course, I have a look at the walking camera. I love these birds with the hard shell. I love all the birds, actually. And they have a very dark skin, but they also have the new feather skin, which was updated visually. So they look really cool. I really like how they look. And I also noticed burning trees from lava. And yeah, that is one of the dangers, obviously, of volcanoes, where things around it die. Because the planet was happy, I needed a little bit of chaos. And from the Discord, I had downloaded this demonical creature, thanks to Ben Vrow 2. I'm probably not saying it right. The creature is available on the Discord. And wow, these demonic creatures are like so huge. I was so impressed when I put them in the planet and compared them to how tall they are with the trees. 
and these are predators that can survive in the warmth of our planet. While looking, I also noticed these pink shell features, and I'm like, uh, I live. These are some of my favorite ones so far. For over 20,000 years, I continued to watch the creature map, and it was impressive. 20,000 years, the population count did go down by a couple of hundred, but we still had the demonic predators alive. However, around 5,000 years later, they were extinct, so once more the herbivores and omnivores continued to win and thrive within this planet. Based on that, with maximum volcanoes, with the importation of massive predators that ran wild for over 20,000 years, this planet continues to survive. I cannot perform another mass extinction. It's just very well balanced and life continues to thrive even though it is just one species of tree somehow. The variety of creatures, the variety of life, it continues to survive all the volcanoes, all the lava, all the natural balances. And this is probably one of my most successful planets yet. If you've enjoyed this video, make sure to subscribe and let me know in the comments what I should try next. Bye bye!